the Shark Deck. Hello and welcome to Palace Intrigue. I am your host, Mark Francis. The Mirror's headline. At least Prince Harry is finally providing value for money after all these years. Columnist Mark Steele writes, Four years ago, when Harry and Meghan got married, it felt as if he could be arrested for not being joyful enough. Reporters on every TV channel jumped up and down outside Windsor Castle, spluttering, This is the greatest moment of all time. I saw a blackbird just now, and he was smiling and tweeting the national anthem. The homeless in the area were evicted because you can't have people lying around in sleeping bags on the week of a royal wedding. Then they were immediately replaced by these people who lay in sleeping bags queuing up for four days to see a royal wedding. But from two days after the wedding, the same people were screaming, Who does she think she is? So she left and they all yelled, Oh, where do you think you're going? Up until this point, Harry and Meghan's story made sense. But now he says he killed 25 people in Afghanistan and a woman with special powers relayed messages from his dead mother. Maybe his book was co-written by the writers of Game of Thrones. The Daily Mail's Richard Kay wrote under the headline, Why I'm certain Princess Diana would have been appalled at Prince Harry's grievances. Not long before she died, Princess Diana sat William and Harry down together on the striped sofa in a drawing room at Kensington Palace. The brothers had been bickering, as they often did, and Diana decided to dispense some maternal advice. Listen, she began, you have to look after each other. She reminded them that because of their unique positions as royal princes and objects of curiosity and envy to the world, each was the one person the other should always, her emphasis, be able to rely on. Papa, she said of her ex-husband Charles, has his life and I have mine, so it's important that two of you have each other, be there for each other. As brothers, she said, they must know they could always depend on each other. She ended by saying, I want you to promise that you will be each other's best friend. Will you promise me that? Will you swear it? Both boys, then aged 14 and 12, crossed themselves and swore that they would. I was reminded of that story, which Diana once related to me, as I searched in vain for Harry's account of it in the Spanish version of his explosive and one-sided memoir, Spare. Perhaps I missed it amid the rage and resentment that threads through the 416 pages. Perhaps it was lost in translation, or perhaps it simply wasn't there. Palace Intrigue will be right back. The BBC wondered which royal has come out best in the book Fallout. As for King Charles, they write, What Harry says about the Queen Consort will be hard for his father to stomach. If there is to be any kind of reconciliation, it will have to come from the top. For Camilla, Queen Consort, it has been tough going, but Harry's take on his stepmother is also full of contradictions. He directs much of his media fury her way, accusing her of courting the tabloid press to improve her public image, where she was cast as a villain, a strategy he said that made her dangerous. It is a damaging narrative for a woman for whom public support didn't always come easily. At the same time, in a different chapter, and in an interview answer, the mood is fonder, even affectionate and admiring. He recognises the happiness and peace she has brought his father, and he praises her work with victims of domestic violence. For Harry, Camilla seems confusing. As for William, William is cast here as the angry, frustrated, pent-up big brother. It doesn't match his public persona of the matey, personable, empathetic royal. Kate? Kate is not big on hugging. She doesn't like sharing lip gloss, and there was that infamous misunderstanding over the bridesmaid dresses, Harry tells us. It's hard to see how this would feel personally wounding to the Princess of Wales, especially exposing elements of her private life and that of her children, which she has fiercely protected and managed. Meghan? The book is likely to cement opinions on Meghan. For some, Harry has been rescued by her and escaped to a life of freedom and immense happiness. For others, she has lured him away from duty and family and will never be forgiven. Media coverage this week probably won't change your mind. The New York Times review of Spare compared Harry's style to that of film noir. Harry's distinctly English voice at times does weird battle with the staccato patois of a tough, talking private eye doing voiceover in a film noir. Describing his gangan at Balmoral, she wore blue, I recall, all blue, blue was her favourite colour. Then, like a gun mole, the Queen Mother orders a martini. If there's a murder Harry is trying to solve, it's of course that of his own mother, Princess Diana, whose death in the Pont de Lama Tunnel in 1997 under chase by paparazzi is the defining tragedy of his life and thus of his book. 
In a separate piece, the Times wonders if the Harry and Meghan saga has run its course, writing, Even in the United States, which has a soft spot for royals in exile and a generally higher tolerance than Britain does for redemptive stories about overcoming trauma and family dysfunction, there is a sense that there are only so many revelations the public can stomach. Howard Bragman, the chairman of the crisis management firm La Brea Media, said, You have to realise that you can really only tell your story once. It feels a little reality television-y to me, he added. The couple feel a little Trumpian in that they seem like they can't let a grudge go. And there you have it. If you'd like to email us, our address is thepalaceintrigue at gmail.com. Please follow us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your favourite shows. I'm Mark Francis. My thanks to John McDonald's Palace Intrigue. Good times.